Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I'll start with a couple of announcements. First of all, on Thursday, October 4th, I'm doing a Conversations with Dr. Pam conference call. We're going to talk about confusing research. I get emails every day from people who hear about studies that they're reported in the local newspaper or people send out emails and um, they conflict one another and, and so I'm going to give people some simple tips on how to sort out confusing research and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions about that and any other topics topic you want to discuss. And then on Monday, October 8th, very interesting workshop on how to choose cancer treatments. And um, we're going to have a member talk about her journey in looking at traditional treatments, alternative treatments, how to deal with family, doctors, etc. I mean, let's face it, cancer diagnosis is really frightening and um, uh, often the pressure that doctors and family members place on people makes it far worse than it needs to be. But in any case, you'll have a great opportunity to ask questions of, um, of our member who's been through that whole experience and gain some perspective on uh, yourself if you ever, God forbid, find yourself in this situation or friends who are going through something similar. And so with that, let's get into the topic. I started a couple of days ago covering this very interesting book called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. And uh, it is one of those books that the more you read it, the angrier you get, but it's also really fascinating and stuff we do need to talk about. So I'm gonna pick up where I left off. Um, there's an important difference. We're gonna talk about drug treatment for uh, these diseases um, today and, and for the next several segments. And there's a real important difference in the way that uh, drug treatment evolved for psychiatric patients, or in fact, treatment at all, versus other types of diseases. So what happens with other types of diseases is that knowledge of the disease came before development of the treatment. So for example, bacteria was discovered which caused infections and then antibiotics were developed to treat the infection. It was discovered that diabetics couldn't produce insulin, type 1 diabetics, and then insulin was developed as a therapy. So this wasn't the case, however, with mental and emotional disorders. There was no knowledge of what caused the disease, yet the psychiatric profession never really, never really stopped the psychiatric profession from coming up with all kinds of treatments uh, to address it. And this led to a bizarre series of treatments. I mean, I covered some of them a couple days ago, uh, but many of which were actually discovered while conducting research on other illnesses. In the 1940s, for example, lobotomy was considered useful, and the neurologist who invented it was awarded a Nobel Prize. I mean, it's almost hard to believe right now, but it actually did happen. Thorazine had proven, accidentally by the way, to induce a lobotomy-like state in animals. And in response, French psychiatrists started giving it to psychotic patients. Eventually, it sort of became the standard worldwide with asylums reporting that the insane population was a whole lot quieter and easier to manage if you gave them the drugs. The problem was that the drug induced encephalitis, lethargic, lethargica, which possessed which progressed to um, all kinds of conditions, including Parkinson's-like syndrome. This was followed by another accidental discovery. Frank Berger was working on a treatment for gram-negative bacteria and discovered a drug that was a great muscle relaxer. Even vicious monkeys could be handled after giving it to them. So Berger moved to the United States and his employer, Wallace Labs, eventually released a drug called Milltown. Other drug companies worked to come out with competing products, it was going on even then, that had the same tranquilizing effect. And eventually this class of drugs became used to control the patients, the behavior of patients in the mental hospitals. And it really became a popular thought to just settle everybody down with drugs as a way of managing them better. The next class of drugs was based on the use of hydrazine as a substitute for rocket fuel. Yeah, you heard that right, during World War II. Researchers discovered that derivatives could use, be used to kill tuberculosis and that the drug caused surges of energy in patients who took it, so it was used for depressed patients. The side effects included dizziness, constipation, difficulty, urinating, confusion, and psychosis, so eventually its use had to be curtailed. But uh, one researcher did determine that it could control patients' behavior in the short term, and maybe for a few weeks it might not be a bad idea. The important difference, and I'll come back to this, is that these drugs were not developed in response to an understanding of how people became mentally or emotionally ill. They were just noted to have side effects, particularly in animal models, and it seemed like maybe we should just give them to people, which again sounds like a bizarre and cruel experiment to me. 
The series of events that led to the widespread use of psychiatric drugs really began and had its early origins when the American Medical Association told the American public that its organization would help the public determine good from bad treatments. And at the time, there were lots of elixirs and remedies sold to the public through retail stores and chemical compounds sold through pharmacists. The AMA developed a program to investigate these types of treatments and ostensibly protect the public from quackery. That was the stated goal. The group issued a seal of approval and published a book of approved medicines and the public was told that if you went to a doctor you would get the good and approved medicines and you certainly always wanted to go to a doctor instead of seeking treatment from anyone else. Now, at the same time, in 1938, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act was passed, which required drug companies to prove to the FDA that their products were safe, but there was no requirement that they prove uh, to be helpful, that they were proven to be helpful or useful. The law also provided for some drugs to be available only through doctor's prescription, and the result was that doctors became the retailers for drugs, with pharmacists filling the sales order. And that's exactly how Whitaker expresses it in his books. In his book, drug companies and doctors, for the first time, became economically locked together um, and economically dependent upon one another. Doctors controlled access to the drugs and their journals started accepting advertising for the drugs. And you can see the beginning of a very bad story in terms of patient care. From the beginning, drug research was a flawed system. In 1954, Thorazine was approved after being tested on only 150 patients. The reports were glowing. The patients were able to sleep well, eat well, and remain calm. Milltown followed, which was advertised as a happy pill. It relaxed the muscles and, quote, gave people the ability to enjoy life. Doesn't it sound sort of like the drug commercials that you see on TV? Just glowing reports about all the wonderful things that can happen if you take them. The medical profession began comparing psychiatric drugs for mental patients to insulin for diabetics. Those exact terms were used in the medical profession. More drugs were introduced, including drugs like lithium, with the same scant evidence to support their use. A major change took place in 1963. This is really when the tide turned, when the National Institute of Mental Health conducted a six-week trial of Thorazine and other drugs and, pro and said they reported that they were effective in relieving psychotic symptoms and suggested that instead of calling them tranquilizers, they should be referred to as drugs to treat schizophrenia. Now, that may not seem like a big deal on the surface, but it was a very important development. Drugs that had previously been viewed as just making patients calmer and quieter and easier to manage were now being labeled as treatments to cure or to treat mental patients. But there was no understanding of how they worked biologically and that didn't seem to bother anybody at all. So I'll stop there and during next week's video clips we'll have a continuing series on this very interesting drug uh, book called um, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Wal uh, Robert Whitaker. And I do hope that some of you will be joining us in Columbus to hear Dr. Peter Bragan and Dr. Walter Jacobson talk about this issue in depth. It's aggravating but fascinating and information everybody ought to know.